Amen. Well, thank you again for being here. I just want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here. It's a great honor, and I just, I'm thankful for this church, and I want to thank Brother Corbin and Michelle for the great hospitality, and you're blessed to have this family here Amen. in Tucson, so be, be thankful for Brother Corbin and his family, and his, and uh, just take care of them, pray for them. And so I'm grateful for him and for being here. And we're there in 1 Kings 19, and if you would, as we read it in, the, in 1 Kings 19, we read about a great prophet, Elijah. And of course, there's a lot in the Bible about a great man of God like Elijah. And in 1 Kings 19, we come into a dark time in Elijah's life. We see Elijah going through a difficult time. He's, he's a man who right now he's tired, a man who is depressed, who is in distress. And we see a low time in his life, a valley in his life. And what you must understand is, you know, life, in life, there's going to be mountains and there's going to be valleys. There's going to be times when you and I, we're going to feel like we're on top, when we're on the mountaintop. But there will be times when we feel like we're low, like we're going through a valley. And in life, you know, thinking about today being the one year anniversary of this church, that's a mountaintop for this church. Amen. And it's a mountaintop hearing the salvations that have, been, that have been done this year. The fact that lives are being changed, the fact that the church is growing, you know, you're, you're in a new building. These are all mountaintops. You know, there's a new baby in the room. Praise the Lord. That's, that's a mountaintop. But in life, life is not all about the mountaintops. There will be valleys in life, times that are where we struggle like Elijah. And what's interesting about 1 Kings 19 is that this chapter comes right after the mountaintop experience for Elijah. If you go to 1 Kings 18 and look at verse number 37, 1 Kings 18, we're going to see the mountaintop of the life of Elijah. When we see Elijah versus the prophets of Baal, the showdown in Mount Carmel. And notice the, what the man of God does in 1 Kings 18, verse 37. Here we have Elijah speaking to God. He said, notice, hear me, O Lord, hear me. And here we have Elijah, and he's facing 850 false prophets. It says, it goes on, it says, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, notice, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Notice verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. Here we have the mountaintop in the life of Elijah. When Elijah, the man of God, prays into God and God calls fire to come down from heaven. And we see doing this great work. And it goes on, it says, and consume the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and look up, licked up the water that was in the trench. Verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And at this time, I believe that the people were literally, they were, they were genuinely afraid of God when they see this fire come down from heaven. And I also believe that they were afraid of the man Elijah, a man who can call up to God and call the fire from down. And we see the mountaintop for a man of Elijah, who people saw him call down fire from heaven. Notice verse 40, notice the boldness of the man of God. It says, and Elijah said unto them, verse 40, take the prophets of Baal, let none of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. Here we see the boldness of the man, Elijah. And in your life and in my life, there will, there will come times in our lives when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're bold, when we're strong, when we have the power of God in our lives, when we're on the mountaintop facing 850 false prophets, and we see a great victory done in God through us. But as we get to chapter 19, what do we see after the mountaintop? We see a low place, a valley in the life of Elijah. Look at verse number one, 1 Kings 19, verse one. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now I want you to notice, here we have Elijah, who at one point, just a few days ago, was facing 850 false prophets with boldness, with power, confronting them, calling upon God. And here we have in 1 Kings 19, a woman, one single woman making a simple threat to what was once a strong man. And notice the response in verse three, notice. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. Here we have a man who at one point was strong in might, was not afraid of anything, had the power of God, was on the mountaintop, calling down fire, facing 850 false prophets, and now he's running for his life from the threat of one single woman. But in your life and in my life, there will be times when you and I, we feel like we can conquer the mountain. But there will be times in our lives when we feel like we're in a valley. We feel like Elijah in this chapter, a man who can get depressed, 
can get tired, can get discouraged, can feel like things are not going the way that they should. Here, place there, 1 Kings 19, we go to James chapter number 5, James 5. And this evening I'm preaching on responding to the lows of the Christian life. Responding to the lows of the Christian life. You go to James chapter number 5, see, life is a life of ups and downs. And today, you know, one year anniversary, it's a mountaintop. But you know what? There's always a valley after the hill. There's, once you get to the top, there's always the, a steep slope down. But notice what it says about a man, Elijah, in James 5. Look at verse number 17. It says, Elias, referring to Elijah in James 5, 17. Notice, Elias was a man, notice, subject to like passions as we are. The Bible says that the man, Elijah, this great man of God, was a man subject to like passions as we are. See, Elijah was a man like you, was a man like me, and we think that these great men of God are somehow, that, that God is some respect of persons, but no, these are just men like you and like me. And like you, there will come times in your life when things are going great, when you have victories in your life, but there will come times in your life when, like Elijah in this chapter, when he wants to quit, he wants to run, he doesn't feel like he has the power of God in his life, and we see a valley in the life of Elijah. So, so tonight, I'm preaching on how to respond to these times, how to respond to the times in your life when you feel tired, when you feel distressed, and we feel depressed. Go back to 1 Kings 19. So number one, I just have three points this evening because I heard there's cake. You know, I'm not going to let that cake go to waste. So 1 Kings 19. So number one this, this evening, when you come to the low times in your life, you must understand that sometimes you just need to regain your physical strength. You need to regain your physical strength. Look at verse number four in 1 Kings 19, verse four. It says, notice, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Notice, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. See, Elijah was tired. And what you'll notice is that as you're living the Christian life, as you're working in the ministry, as you're just being a church member, living for God, you will be tired sometimes. You'll get physically drained. And sometimes you just need a break. You just need to sit down. And notice what it says. It says, and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Verse 5, And as he lay and slept on a juniper tree, behold, notice, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Notice, Arise and eat. See, Elijah, at this point in his life, he was just physically tired. He was wore out. And the angel of God comes and he wants to strengthen him. How? Physically. He said, Arise and eat. Look at verse number 7. It says, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Notice, because the journey is too great for thee. And the journey is great in your life. The journey of you raising your kids, that's a great journey. The journey of this church of reaching this whole area with the gospel, that is a great journey. The journey of you cleaning up your life, of you living for God, that is a great journey. And you must understand that you need your physical strength as well as your spiritual strength if you're going to complete that journey. And sometimes when you come to those points, when, like Elijah, when you want to quit, when you feel tired, when you feel depressed and distressed, sometimes all you need is a little physical, is a little physical rest. Sometimes you need to rest and just regain your strength. Here, place in 1 Kings 19, but go to Mark chapter 6. Mark 6. Mark chapter number 6. And, you know, by the way, as far as this point, as far as you re regaining your physical strength, look, you need to work in order to be tired. If you're not working, you don't need to rest. Right. You need to go to work. And so if you're someone who says, hey, man, I just sleep all day. This is not for you. You know, if you if all you do is rest, then, you know, this is not for you. You need to get to work. Right. And if you're working in the ministry, if you're living for God, do what you're supposed to be doing. Like you will get wore out sometimes. Sometimes physically, you know, we're human beings. We live in, we live in the flesh sometimes. You know, we get tired. And so sometimes you just need to rest. Mark 6, look at verse number 30. Mark 6, 30. Notice what it says in verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus. Now, Mark chapter 6, here we have, in this chapter, Jesus sent his disciples to go soul winning. And notice what it says. And told him all things, in verse 30, both what they had done and what they had taught. Verse 31. And he said unto them, notice, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place. He said, go to Tucson. Go to the desert. Just kidding. <laughs> He's saying, go get alone. You know, get away for a little bit. Notice, and what? And rest a while. For there were many coming and going. And notice, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. You know, these people were literally in the ministry. And what you understand is if you're in the ministry, you know, a man like Brother Corbin and like your pastor, look, they work hard. And sometimes, look, they need, they need rest. 
They need their strength if they're going to do this great work for God. But you, in your life, you know, when you're going to church three times a week, when you're going soul winning faithfully, reading your Bible, doing what God has called you to do, look, sometimes you just need a break. If you get tired, if you get, you know, wore out, depressed or distressed, it's okay to get into a desert place and just relax a little bit. In verse 32, and they departed into a desert place by ship, notice, privately. So Jesus, he sends his apostles away because they worked hard in the ministry. And look, when you work in the ministry, then sometimes you need a break. But look, if you're not working, then you don't need a break. You need to get to work. So if you're not doing anything, don't take this as, yeah, I'm just, I'm so spiritual because I'm resting. You know, I'm in the desert because I'm in Tucson. No, you need to get to work. And so you need rest because you're busy working. And so if you're not working, then you know what? This is not for you. And what you must understand about the Christian life is that the Christian life is measured in decades. And what we'll see is, you know, people get real zealous right away. They get saved, they get really zealous, and they, they want to do everything right away, which is great, but sometimes they burn out physically. And if you're going to make it in the long run, you must take care of yourself physically as well. And really, sometimes you just need a break. Keep your place there, Mark, go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes 7, so number 1. How do you respond to the lows of the Christian life? Sometimes you just need to regain your strength. Sometimes you just need to rest. You need some food. Recover yourself and take care of yourself physically. Ecclesiastes 7 in verse 16, Ecclesiastes 7, 16, the Bible says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Notice, why shouldest thou destroy thyself? It says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. It says, Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Go to Ecclesiastes 12, if you would. Ecclesiastes 12, look at verse number 12. Ecclesiastes 12, 12, it says, And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. Notice, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. It says much study, even reading the word of God, studying the Bible, look, that'll take its toll on you physically sometimes. It is draining when you have to study for a sermon. You know, it's physically draining. And so, you know, in churches, sometimes people think, oh, well, you just work for the church, so you must have it easy. Look, it is work when you're working in the ministry. People are coming and going. It is nonstop. And look, sometimes, you know, Brother Corbin was mentioning this. Sometimes you just got to get away and stop thinking about things. Because when you just think and think and think and you're studying and studying and studying, it will take a toll on you physically. And so you need to allow your man of God to sometimes rest. But you and your life as well. If you find yourself in a place where you feel like you can't go on, where you feel like it's getting too much, you feel distressed and depressed, look, sometimes you just need to take a break right. and just regain yourself physically. Go, back, go to Genesis 2, if you would. Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. Look, the answer is never to quit. Amen. And here we see Elijah you know, to the point where he wants God to end his life. He wants to quit. But all he needed was to rest a little bit. Genesis 2, look at verse number 1. Genesis 2, 1. Here we have God speaking of creation. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended, notice, his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. See, even God, when he created the world, it says he took a day to rest. And here's the thing, you rest because you work. So if you're not working, then you don't need rest, you need to get to work. But sometimes in life, when you come to these points, realize it may just be, you just, you're just tired physically, and that's okay. God says it's okay. Jesus said, you know what? Go to a desert place, relax, and take a little break. Go back to 1 Kings 19. So how do you respond to the lows of the Christian life? Because look, the lows will come. It's not always a mountain. The lows will come. Sometimes you just need to take a break. You know, thinking about this, this point, thinking about the Red Hot Preaching Conference. You know, the Red Hot Preaching Conference is definitely a mountaintop experience if you go there. But let me tell you something. It is exhausting working, you know, in the church, you know, putting that thing on. It takes days to recover from that. Right. And sometimes, you know, after the mountaintop, you just need a little bit of a break. You know, it's the same thing in your life. If you feel like, man, I've been going and going, marathon this and conference this, realize sometimes you just got to take a break. So number one, I said, you need to regain your strength when it comes to lows in your life. You need to rest. But number two, when it comes to the lows in the Christian life, to the valleys, to the hard times, to the times of when you're distressed or depressed, number two is you need to get your mind right. You need to get your mind right. What do I mean? Well, look at verse number nine, 1 Kings 19, verse nine. It says, And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, notice, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, 
thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. Notice, notice what Elijah says, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Notice what Elijah is saying. He said, I, even I only am left. See, Elijah at this point, because he was depressed, distressed, exhausted, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm the only one. He was saying there's no one and else. So understand when you're going through your difficult time, through your valley, understand that you're not alone. Amen. And oftentimes when we get to the hard times in our lives, when we get depressed or distressed, we often think it's only me. Nobody else gets it. I'm the only one. It's just me. But the truth is, you're not alone. Right. Look at verse number 14. He goes on and says, notice, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword again. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And look, when you get depressed, when you get distressed, when you get tired, you often think, you know what, it's just me. And you know what, people are really good at throwing themselves a little pity party. You know, we love parties, and we all throw them sometimes, but we just think it's all me. And I'm the only one, nobody gets it, and nobody knows. But notice the response from God in verse 18. 1 Kings 19, 18 says, Notice, yet I have left me, notice, 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You know what God said? God says, you know what? You're not the only one. And look, when you come into your valley in life, in whatever that is, whether it's in your marriage, with your child rearing, whether it's in this church, realize you're not the only one. You know, your story isn't unique. You're not the only one. There's other people that are going through the exact same thing you are, but sometimes we get to this point, like Elijah, where we think, I'm the only one, but God says, no, there's 7,000 people just like you. And so realize, you're not the only one. Go to 1 Peter 5, if you would, 1 Peter chapter number 5. And look, we've all been there, where we think, man, nobody gets it, I'm the only one. And we like to throw ourselves these little pity parties, but we must understand, look, you're not the only one. And so when you come to these times of low, of valleys in your life, realize it really is a mental game. It's a mental struggle. So realize when you get there, you're not unique. You're not the only one. You know, yes, you are special, but you're not that special. First Kings 5, I'm sorry, First Peter 5. First Peter 5, we saw this in the morning. First Peter 5, verse number 8. Again, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice verse 9 again. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that what that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world yeah. see whatever you're going through realize that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren in the world go to chapter 4 verse 12 first peter 4 12 it says notice first peter 4 12 beloved think it not strange what does that mean don't think you're unique don't think you're the only one think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though what as though some strange thing happened unto you we often think, oh man, I'm unique. This is my story. But don't think that some strange thing happened unto you. What's happening to you, the values that you're going through, hey, people have been there. You know, people understand. And don't think you're the only one. Verse 13 says, but rejoice in as much as what? As ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And look, Jesus Christ, you know, he was tempted in all points like as we are. Amen. You know, he struggled as well. He, he shed, he, he cried as well. Right. You know, he was tired as well. He needed to rest as well. So you, in your valley, you know, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He's not unique. And you're not unique. I'm not unique. Look, all of us, we go through times where we just need to take a break and relax. And when you're going through your hard time, realize in your mind, you're not the only one. Because, like, it's easy for us to think, hey, nobody else gets it. But you know what? You're not special. And so go, go back to 1 Kings 19, if you would. So number one, need to regain your strength. Number two, you need to get your mind right. What does that mean? Realize you're not the only one, but also understand that life is not all about the mountaintop. Life is not all about the mountaintop. I want you to notice what happens in verse number nine again. First Kings 19 verse nine. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And notice the response we have from God in verse 11. And he said, go forth, 
stand upon the mount before the Lord. And notice, and behold, the Lord passed by. And notice, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains. I want you to notice that a great and strong wind passed by Elijah. And you would think, man, here we have, here we have God's power before him. But notice what it says. And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Notice, but the Lord was not in the, in the wind. It says that this wind that break the rocks. You would think, man, here's the power of God. But here it says, notice that the Lord, he was not in the wind. And you and I would think, man, God is definitely in that wind. But it says, no, God's not there. It goes on and it says, and after the wind, notice an earthquake. And you and I would think, man, here we have the earth shaking. And we would think, man, here is definitely the power of God. Here is the Lord. But notice, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. It goes on. And after the earthquake, a fire. And you must think, surely this must be it. When the chapter before, here we have Elijah calling upon God and God sent fire down from heaven. And you think, here is the power of God. But notice, it says, but the Lord was not in the fire. See, oftentimes we think that the Christian life is all about the wind. That it's all about the earthquake. That it's all about the fire. That it's all about the mountaintops. You say, what are you talking about? Oftentimes we think that the Christian life is all about the Red Hot Preaching Conference. It's all about this mega marathon. It's all about the one year anniversary. It's all about these big events, these exciting things where we see the wind, where we see the earth shaking, we see the fire. We think this surely, this is all what it's all about. But God says, no, it's not in those things. See, I believe that God was teaching Elijah a lesson in life that you know what, life is not all about the mountaintops. And look, the mountaintops are great. They're gonna be there. Hey, today's great, but you know what? Wednesday night's coming. Thursday night church is coming. So life is not all about the mountaintops. So the point is, don't be a spiritual adrenaline junkie. When you think, man, it's all about this main event. And look, I know people in Sacramento who they will only show up to church if Pastor Anderson shows up. Who will only go to church at the Red Hot Preaching Conference. There was a couple there that showed up at the conference who live in Sacramento, but they only show up for that event. And I'm thinking to myself, is, is that what you think Christianity is about? Just that one main event? But notice what it says in verse 12 again. And after the, fi after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And notice, and after the fire, a still, small voice. You see, what is the Christian life? The Christian life is the still, small voice. And look, the earthquakes are exciting. The fires are exciting. The wind is exciting. But realize it's not all about the mountaintop. See, when does Christianity begin? Christianity begins... Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you listen to that still small voice. When you pray to God and nobody's watching you. When you spend time alone with God and nobody knows it. See, the Christian life is not all about just the main event. No, it's about the still small voice in your life. The question is, where are you going to be on Thursday night when, hey, it's not a special night. Amen. When nothing really is going on. It's just First Timothy chapter 4. You know, wh where are you going to be? See, that's Christianity. The Christianity is you living a consistent life with just you and that still small voice. Go to Matthew 14, if you would. Matthew chapter 14. And when you come to the times in your life when it's, when it's a low point, realize, hey, it's not about being just on the mountaintop. It's not about the main event. Look, Christianity is about the still small voice. You spending time alone with God. And look, what you'll find in the New Testament is a man like is it Jesus Christ. He would spend time alone with God on purpose. Matthew 14, verse number 23. Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, and notice in this chapter, this is after Jesus feeds 5,000 people. It says, And we had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, notice he was there alone. You say, What is Christianity? Is it just the conferences? Is it just the mega marathon? No, it's when you can spend time alone with that still small voice. Spend time alone with God. And get alone with God. See, that's Christianity. Yeah. So the question is, where are you going to be on Thursday night when nothing's going on? Right. Are you going to be with God's people in God's house? Where are you going to be tomorrow morning when nobody's watching you? Are you going to be reading your Bible, spending time with a still, simple, still small voice, or just waiting for the next main event? Right. Mm -hmm. Go, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. Luke 1. So understand that the Christian life is not all about the mountaintop. And look, you know, I get excited about things too. You get excited about things too. But here's the thing. And people, it seems to me, people online, they're just waiting for the next main event. And they just want to pop out when something big happens. But wh where are you when nobody's around? Where are you when it's just, when there's no event going on? 
Are you with that still small voice? Luke 1, look at verse number 80. And the child, in verse 80, here we have John the Baptist. Notice, and the child, John the Baptist, grew and waxed strong in spirit. Notice, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. See, before John the Baptist came on the scene, you know what he did? He spent time in the deserts, waxing strong in spirit, growing in the Lord, spending time alone with that still, small voice. You say, I want to be used by God someday. I want to be used by God maybe to preach the word of God. Amen. What are you doing with a still, small voice? Because you're not going to get there if you're not spending time alone in the deserts with a still, small voice. And look, here's the thing. Main events, the fires, the earthquakes, the winds, the conferences, they can get you boosted, but it's only short term. What gets you through the long run will be that still, small voice. You spending time alone with the word of God. Go back to 1 Kings 19. So number one this morning, responding to the lows of the Christian life. Number one, realize when you get there, sometimes you just need to regain your strength. Sometimes you just got to rest. You got to eat. Get yourself right physically. But number two, you got to get your mind right. Realize you're not alone. You're, you know, you're not that unique. People have been there. Right. And you got to realize that it's life, the Christian life is not all about the mountaintop. There will be valleys in the, mountaintop, in, the, in the Christian life. But number three, when you get to your low place in your life, when you get to a point when you feel distressed, depressed, like you want to quit, Number three, realize that people need you. Realize that people need you. Look at verse number 15, 1 Kings 19, verse 15. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, notice, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And what and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, of Abel Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. It's funny, but in the middle of Elijah's depression, of him wanting to quit, God says, you know what, Elijah, people need you. I need you to go anoint these three men to do the purpose that God has called you to do. And in the same way, look, when you get to your place, when I get to my place, realize that people need you. You know, me as a father, when I get to my low place, look, I can't just stay there. Why? Because I have a wife. I have three kids, another one on the way. Realize that I could just throw a pity party for myself all day, but what about my kids? Right. Do they need a father who's just in pity, just saying it's all me, boo-hoo. No, he needs, he needs them to lead them. The same thing you in your life, you know, if you're a mom, look, you, there's times when you get depressed, distressed, but realize your kids need you. Your husband needs you. This church needs you. People in your life need you. So realize that when you get there, Elijah, don't think you should quit. No, because you know what? People need you to get to work. People need you to get back to the purpose that God has called you to do. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look, all of us, we go through these lows in our life. But realize that, you know what, you affect people and people need you. You don't live on an island. The choices you make and the decisions you choose to do affect other people. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse number 24, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. The Bible says, verse 24, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. The Bible says, that, let no man seek his own. Meaning what? Meaning it's not all about you and your problems and your pity party, but it says, no, but every man another's wealth. Go to chapter 9, if you would. 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 9, look at verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 9, 20. It says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Look at verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. Notice, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. See, the Apostle Paul lived his life living for other people. Living his life, doing what he needed to do for the sake of saving other people. And you in your life, when you get to your low place, realize that people need you to be that father, to be that mother, to be that Christian that God needs you to be. Why? Because you affect people. Right. And you know what? The decisions you choose to do they will affect others whether you realize it or not. Go to chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. And same thing in this church. 1 Corinthians, so realize that this church is, is a family, whether you know it or not. 1 Corinthians, so, and, look, and you in this church, you affect other people. 1 Corinthians 12, look, look at verse number 26. Notice what it says. It says, and whether one member suffer, this is referring to church, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Realize that if you're going through a hard time, and this church realizes that, that it, it affects people. And look, people are there for you. That's why we have church. It's okay to go through hard times. But realize the point, the solution is not to quit. 
the solution is to come to church and hey, let's let's help, let's help you out, let's pray for you, let's get let's get you, get you back. Notice, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So the point is, look, that you affect other people, and you cannot live your life just in a life of pity, in a life of just depression, a life of just distress. Why? Because people need you to be somewhere. This church needs you to be somewhere. Your family needs you to be somewhere. The lost souls, they need you to be somewhere. And don't allow the valleys in your life to take you out of the purpose that God has called you to do in your life. Don't allow you to get to the point like Elijah where he wants to quit. The Bible says in Philippians 2, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, it's not all about me and what I want. It's about other people. And so in our Christian lives, we should realize we should put other people first. So number one this evening, how do you respond to the Christian life? Number one, sometimes when you get to your low place, you just need to regain your strength. You need to relax. You need to rest. Recover yourself physically. Number two, you need to get your mind right. Realize that you're not alone. Other people have been there. And realize it's not, not, not all about the mountaintop. And number three, you must realize that people need you to be where they need you to be. Go if you would to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James 1, and we'll end here. James 1. What you must understand about the valleys is that you must allow the hard times, the valleys in your life to strengthen you. You must allow the valleys to strengthen your faith, to help you grow. Because the truth is, I don't have to go around and ask you, but I'm sure you've been through a hard time in your life. I've been through hard times in my life. But you allow those things, those times to strengthen your faith in the Lord. Right. James 1, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, James 1, 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse, notice, temptations. What, are, what is that? Those are the trials in life, the hard times. It says, count it all joy. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And what you'll notice is that when you go through hard times and you get victory and you go through them again and get victory, It'll help you gain patience in life. It'll help you give you some experience. Verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work. They may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It says, let patience have what? Her perfect work. Realize that in the valleys, God is still working on you. God is still working in you. That it's not all about the mountaintop. And it says, they may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. You see, how is God going to make me the Christian that he wants me to be? It's through the hard times in your life. Look, right. It takes pressure to make a diamond. Right. And the only way that God is going to purge you in your life, the only way He's going to make you grow is through putting you through the fire. Yeah. To allow you to go through those hard times in your life and realize that that's God working in you. That it's not all about the fire. It's not all about the wind. It's not all about the earthquake. But no, it's God wanting to get you alone with Him with that still, small voice. Yeah. So if you're at a mountaintop right now, hey, that's great, but realize there's a valley coming. Or if you're in a valley right now, realize, hey, God is working in your life. God wants you to spend time with him alone and the still small voice. And the answer, Elijah, is never to quit. The answer is to keep going and allow God to work in your life. Let's close in prayer.